All right, welcome back. Our sign language interpreter for this interview is Yula Nzale and Victoria Rubadiri continuing our conversation. It is immunization week that kicks off tomorrow. Well, Kenya is in a race against time to hit a target of 90% of children in the country immunized. Well, this year's theme speaks to the big catch up. And so key stakeholders, including the Kenya Pediatric Research Consortium through the Championing Evidence-Based Advocacy Project, are having critical conversations like the one we are about to have around immunization this week. And the County First Ladies Association has also come on board to advocate for improved access to immunization on the ground. Joining me in studio now, right in the center, is the gentleman, Dr. Frederick Kireki Omanwa, who's the president of the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. He is a seasoned and well-respected fertility specialist as well as a senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Also joining the conversation uh, to my close right, Dr. Christine Shege from the Kenya Pediatric Research Consortium. Uh, she is also the senior technical advisor and national immunization champion. And representing the County First Ladies Association is Her Excellency Agnes Ochilo, the Migori County First Lady. Thank you all for joining me this evening for this critical conversation. Um, Dr. Christine, let me begin with you. And let's kind of start in laying the ground for why immunization is important in the first place. Thank you very much. That's a very important question. So immunization is one of the strategies mm. that we use to protect uh, people against infectious diseases. The other strategies being clean water and sanitation. So what exactly is immunization? So immunization is the act of introducing a substance to the body, mm -hmm. either through injection or through giving drops by mouth so that you make the body produce substances yeah. to ensure that the next time the disease, the actual disease comes along, you will actually remember that disease from the immunization you got and produce antibodies or substances to fight that disease. So it is very, very important to get immunized. And why is it so important that it happens at least in the first years of life? So various uh, factors, the most being that uh, very young children are vulnerable to the most uh, dangerous diseases mm -hmm. such as pneumonia, meningitis, uh, severe diarrhea, and measles, among others. So in order to give them early protection, that's why we ensure that most of the vaccines are given in the first year of life. And when you're looking at, because this is, of course, to prevent child mortality, especially the under fives, it's a critical group. Um, when you look at the statistics, where we are as a country, how are we faring? We have made very many gains as a country in tandem with what is happening globally. So our target has always been to reach above 90%, because when you reach a target of above 90% immunized, then a lot of people are protected and those diseases cannot actually reach because they find everybody is immunized. But where are we as a country? We had made gains uh, up to 2020, we had uh, reached 83%, but unfortunately, when uh, COVID came along, we went down a little bit for the first few months as we tried to grapple with, is, what is this new thing that has come? Are we all going to die? Fortunately, the government intervened in time yeah. and laid out strategies to ensure that the Caregivers felt safe taking their children to the facilities. And so rapidly, uh, as much as we had dropped by 5% from 83%, we actually went back. By May, we were back on target. So we are still in the, uh, let me say, 83 84%, depending on who is reporting. So, so we still have room to get to 90%. There's still 
work to be done. No, certainly. And talking about that work that needs to be done, Dr. Kireki, let me bring you in here. Um, several challenges exist when it comes to trying to close that gap. The target is 90%. Yes. Um, we're not too far from that as a country. But where do you see the areas that we need to kind of address almost immediately? First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to the studio. And thank you for for bringing this discussion up so that um, we may be able to contribute to it. Just to take you just a little bit back sure. on our statistics. Our statistics don't look very good. Um, um, from, 19, from 2012 to 20, uh, 2020, our cancer rates have increased by about 14%. And um, number one cancer in terms of disease, what you call morbidity, is breast cancer, followed by cervical cancer, mm -hmm. then followed by prostate cancer, esophagus cancer, and then rectal cancer. Cancer. In terms of deaths, cervical cancer is number one, and then breast cancer, and then these other cancers um, uh, follow. Now, um, why is this discussion very, very important? It is important because here we are talking about women who are dying for something that can actually be prevented. In Kenya today, about 3,200 women die in a year because of something that is preventable, something that can actually be immunized against, and that is uh, cervical cancer. Put it this way, you know, when we talk about 3,200, mm -hmm. it looks like so what is, a, but when we narrow it down, it's about uh, nine women dying every day. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was it, nine women died. Today, amongst those women who went to church, today for those ones who go to church, there are nine women who died. So, in essence, what we are saying is that there are nine families families who have lost a mother today. Mm -hmm. There are nine children somewhere who have lost a mother. There are nine, you know, husbands who have lost a wife and so on and so forth. So this is something which is very, very um, important. And most of the reason that uh, this is something which can actually be very easily uh, uh, be preventable. We talk about 90%, you know, um, um, immunization rate. In 2018, uh, the WHO came up with, um, um, you know, with a guy Guideline mm. and says it's, it's a 90, 70, 90, you know, sort of protocol. And basically, what it means is that um, we need by 2030 to immunize at least 90% of girls who are 15 and under f up to 15 years. We need to um, uh, to screen at least 70% of women who are in the ages of you know up to 35 years of age, and we need to treat 90 percent of the women who come with a diagnosis which is precancerous. Where are we? I don't think we are very near there. In terms of uh, immunization, mm -hmm. um, as my colleague here had said, um, uh, you know, there was a program which was started by, by the government, which actually had a very, a very good uptake. We had pilot, um, uh, uh, pilot counties, which actually took it up very well, but then bang, Mm. came COVID-19 and it has taken us back, you know, several, several years. So I'm not very sure that we'll be able to get it by 2030, yeah. but uh, it is always, you know, like a long jumper, sometimes has to move back and then, you know, move, move ahead and make a huge jump. And uh, I think we can, it, there is a possibility of, of us achieving that 90% immunization. How do we have to do that? Yeah. Obviously, there are many areas which need to come together. We as, um, um, as an organization, the Kenyan Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. We are uh, firmly and 100% behind um, behind these um, uh, uh, these um, this movement, call it a movement. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, pediatricians as well, because the 15-year girls are actually right in their um, in their domain, as it were. And I think uh, you have done very well to bring um, Her Excellency here because we need the political arm as well. Okay. So when we work together as professionals and we have the political you know, side you know, supporting this, then there is a chance of actually us getting there. Just again to remind us, um, in uh, I think 1998 or around 2000, there is um, something which was called the Abuja Declaration, mm -hmm. whereby countries, African countries, went and declared in Nigeria, in Abuja. And they signed and they said from that time onwards, every year they were going to increase the budgetary allocation to the health, you know, the health sector by 15% of the GDP. Have we done that? Are we doing that? No, we haven't done that. So I think we have quite a lot of work to do before we get there. But um, as one of our colleagues said, our dreams are valid. So I think we will get there.
No, certainly. And I want to get um, Madam Agnes in on this because, you know, you've heard some of the struggles. You know very intimately what happens with your constituents on the ground. Before we get into what is needed, um, walk us through a typical day for a mother in Migori County accessing health services. Thank you. Uh it, th that's a very relevant question. Uh, of course, I'm here courtesy of uh, the County First Ladies Association, where I am the deputy chair. Uh, and I'm, I'm also here as a mother. Mm. The mothers were expected to take their children to the clinics, the ones who give birth. And I'll tell you, in this world, a woman will fight for her, ch for her child, irrespective of what comes her way. So when you see a woman not presenting the child for immunization, despite what mm. the doctors have said, the benefits, because we all want our children to be the top and not the tail, mm. then it means it is really, really difficult. I, I, I'm privileged because I've lived in the city and I've lived in the village. In the village, the woman will wake up and the first thing that, that comes to their mind is what are my children going to eat? Yeah. So your first stop is to find out how you are going to get food for the children. Unless a child is sick, you will not think of going to the hospital. Then you go to the place where you're looking for the food, you'll stay there up to lunchtime. Again, you want to come back and find out what your child is going to eat. And that will take you up to the evening. So if, there, if there's nothing that is interfering with the child, then you will not even think of going to look for immunization. Yet these are things that are very critical right. and these children still have to live. And at times you go to the clinics and then you find the, immun the, 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 the vaccines are not there. Mm because we've had erratic supplies, I think because of factors that maybe they'll explain to us. So that, that will even prevent you from now going an, another time. You'll say, if I went on a specific day and I didn't get, why should I go back again? So the things that are stopping the women from getting these vaccines are things that are beyond their control. Mm -hmm. And they need somebody outside their system to come and assist them because no woman wants their child to perish. No woman wants their child to get sick. No woman, every woman wants their child to grow, to be, bright and everything to be a perfect as it as it were so if you see that a ch we still have the percentages we are talking about like in Migori we have 85 percent in counties like the northern counties we even have the the, the figures are 20 percent yeah. so that means only two children out of 10 are are, are are protected so these are issues that we need to find out how the government can come in I know the counties are funded I know they are given money but that money is not enough because they are competing with emergencies they are competing with factors that that have to be addressed immediately. I think the doctors were on strike in the other day. So tell me, if a governor gets some funds, is he going to look at the immunization program or he'll pay them first? You have accidents happening. So it is something that I think the government has to find another solution so that we don't even target 90%. We want to do 100%. Because I keep saying, maybe the 1% percent you are leaving is the one who will be the, 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 the president for this country. So we need 100%. Because no woman wants their child to perish in any way. You talked about something very critical, which is, you know, if a mother doesn't see the need in taking the child to clinic because they're not sick, immunization is probably a second, third, fourth thought. How do you get them to see the priority and the need? Who, who does that? We, 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 we are getting out to speak to them, yeah. but their priority is the survival for the day. I don't, I, I don't know if you are aware of the poverty level back in the village. You, the, the child wakes up, they want food. Mm. You don't have even the, 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 the hundred shillings to buy for them the breakfast. So much as you may be aware or may not be aware about the benefits of immunization, then that becomes a second thought because immediately you have to find out, are they going to eat today? They have to go to school. Are they ready? Do they have the books? Do they have everything that is required of them? So much as they would wish to have immunization at the mm -hmm. forefront, the other competing factors take over and then immunization becomes a second thought. Not because they don't want, no, but because absolutely. circumstances force them to do that. Right. You know, Dr. Christine, I, I'm, I'm hearing what the First Lady is saying. Um, and I think about a network that already exists, that's the community health volunteers, right? And how we can kind of leverage on that existing network. We're seeing that happening quite effectively in counties like Vihiga. Um, and how else can other counties tap into that existing resource? Okay, I think um, I will move a, a step back because as our first lady was talking, I was just thinking that immunization is not something that we can look at in isolation. Mm. You know, she mentioned survival. Mm. And what came to mind is child survival. 
and immunization is one of the child's survival strategies but cannot be looked at in isolation because the other child survival strategies include uh, nutrition yeah. yeah this child must eat the other child survival strategies include clean water so we must uh, bring the child survival strategies together and then uh, in uh, immunization we must link immunization to other health services yeah because you again uh, yeah, our first lady said mother and child you should never and we have our gynecologist here you should never delink the mother from the child never separate and f uh, i just allow me not to mention the fathers for these particular purposes but the mother and the child are one so their services should be harmonized as one so i know that they w um, they would want to, uh, many of them are actually aware of the need for immunization and of course we need to keep emphasizing like um before every uh, immunization session most or many of the counties some of them don't do it but there should be a session of education and it's not education on just matters immunization but education touching on matters child health child survival good feeding breastfeeding which is one of the key child survival strategies but again like we said poverty levels we must tackle poverty so we must harness all that is in our power yeah we have the community health volunteers who are the link to the household so those ones we can use them for various purposes tracking the children mm. tracking the children who are not only uh, missing immunization if a child comes for immunization and doesn't come for the next immunization go to the register find where is that child but like our first lady said, no mother wants to see her child die. Everybody wants to see their children thriving. So let us uh, find these children. Let us use the health volunteers to go out, not only educate, because the, the mothers are educated about the benefit of immunization, but they need to be supported by all means to be able to go by ensuring that the children are fed ensuring that um, all the resources are met yeah so that all they have to think about is how to get to the uh, facility but in addition the facilities should have not only the vaccines because vaccines do not operate alone vaccine operate with syringes vaccines op there are so many things that come into play the fridges where those vaccines are stored and not only that the chain from, you know, those vaccines are not manufactured here. They're manufactured elsewhere. So how do those vaccines get from the manufacturing point all the way to that child? So there are various bottlenecks. And the biggest one is how does the vaccine get from the store to the actual county? Counties are limited in their funding, I think mm -hmm. our first lady has told us. Right. So who is going? to take up that cost. And that is something that we need to address. Who should take up the cost? In Who your should take up the cost? Yeah. And not only that, now that uh, we are talking about funding the vaccines, uh, we have our partners. We have the biggest funder of our vaccines, other than the government, mm -hmm. being the Gavi. Yeah. Gavi uh, is, is, is funding the vaccines but now we are a low and uh, we are considered a middle income country low middle income country so come 2030 kenya will have to fully finance procurement of vaccines are we following the abuja declaration that uh dr here spoke about are we increasing our health funding yeah as much as we are a devolved country we are all kenyans Every child in Migori, wherever, in Northeastern, they are all Kenyans. So we need to all find how can we build a pot yeah, from which each child can take from to ensure they are vaccinated. Right. So that will be a conversation that we will need to 
continue having. I think it's a conversation we can have now. Um, yes, you know, and, and Dr. Kiraki, let me ask you this because um, Dr. Christine just talked about some of the challenges, the bottlenecks, yes. you know, when you're dealing with um, a group like Gavi uh, in their supply, they're going to scale down their funding by 2030. So how do we kind of get ahead before we are caught out <laughs> by the time that year <laughs> arrives? Now, that is an interesting question. How do we plan? How do we, you know, how do we organize ourselves? Um, somebody said that teaching time saves nine. Yeah. Maybe he was actually thinking about the nine women who are dying in Kenya. Yeah. I don't know. But be it as it may, we have this situation. I think, first of all, um, there is probably a lack of awareness mm. when it comes to the importance and the urgency of this situation. Um, uh, actually, research has been shown that for every one dollar that is invested in vaccination, we actually save about 20 downstream. So if we start by vaccinating our children, right from when they are kids, they come to secondary school, they get vaccinated, especially against what we are talking about, yeah. talking about cervical cancer. Uh, if they are vaccinated against cervical cancer, the, um, you know, the dividends downstream are actually uh, very huge. So this is something which we should talk about. Now, I think... Um, the political wing that we have, um, I think we really need to have a serious conversation because, um, first of all, if we have not started increasing our allocation to the health sector to about 15 percent of, um, of our GDP as per the Abuja declaration, come 2030, 2030 is actually down, it's just uh, it's around down the corner, the corner. Yeah. It's just around the corner. Yeah. We will not be ready to actually be able to take this responsibility. Then what happens? Many things we happen. First of all, the ladies who are expectant also will not have their vaccines. Um, uh, downstream, uh, the children who are being born, they will not get the pneumococcal uh, vaccines. They will not, they will not get the rotavirus vaccines. So they will die of, you know, uh, pneumonia infection. They will die of, you know, vomiting and diarrhea, things which are preventable. And then further upstream, when they come a little bit, uh, they grow a little bit older. Uh, remember, we also have an HIV, you know, um, pandemic in this country. Mm -hmm. And remember that actually patients who actually have HIV, who are HIV positive, actually, you know, more vulnerable when it comes to, you know, some uh, infections like, uh, like, um, like HPV infections. So those numbers are going to increase. Mm -hmm. So unless we put our house in order, and how do we put our house in order? There is nothing that works without money. Money speaks a language that everybody understands. So if um, the government is serious about all these things, because it's like, um, it's like an Armageddon which is actually waiting for us downstream, then we have, the government has to invest and seriously invest not only in the procurement of the vaccines, not only in the availability of the vaccines, the accessibility as well has to be there. Um, information has to go to, um, uh, to the general population. Fantastic um, thing you mentioned about community health volunteers, because downstream, actually down at the village level, people sort of identify more with the community health volunteers. They are people who are trustworthy. So we need to equip them with proper information. We need to tell them, now, when uh, patients get to this, this is what they are supposed to get so that we can be able to reap, you know, um, the fruits of uh, our investments, you know, downstream in another 10, maybe 15 years. What did other countries do? For example, in Western Europe, um, talking about a cervical cancer, what they did is that they made it a public um, health, you know, issue. Mm. So if you go to be employed, the first thing, one of the things that your employer will ask you, show me whether you have had a pap smear. Okay. Have you had a pap smear? Yes, you have not had a pap smear, then we will not, you know, have a discussion with you. So uh, that is number one. Number two, information, information, information. I'm grateful that we have this platform which we are using to talk to people. Citizen has a very wide reach, so they are listening and they'll go to their doctors and ask, what is this about this immunization? What is this about these uh, vaccines? What can we do in order to be able to access it? Number three, we need personnel. Yeah. It is, you know, preposterous, if I can put it that way, that we as um, a developing country, mm. 
we may be middle income, but we're still a developing country, uh, that we produce, you know, so many doctors, we produce so many nurses, and then we just let them go just like that. You invest and then you let your investment go just, so it is poor, poor economics, poor finance, um, very poor, I must say. How do you invest several millions in, tra in, in training me as a doctor or as a nurse, and then uh, you just let me go just like that? We need these people to be actually on the ground. Look at it this way, um, uh, Victoria. Um, last time, last time I, had, um, I had a conversation in one of the, the stations. We have a problem in this country. Maternal mortality rate is 362. That is an average. Mm -hmm. But there are some counties where maternal mortality rate is 3,000, 1,700, 1,600. We should actually be talking about this every day. What are we going to do about our maternal mortality rate? And we as a society, as Kenyan Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, it is our mandate to talk about this. And we shall talk about this so that people know. And as I was saying, I think uh, so long as it does not touch me, it is okay, it is out there. Yeah. But when it touches me, it touches my wife, it touches my daughter, it touches somebody close to me, then we sort of look at it differently. I think we need to look at every Kenyan woman, every child, yeah. as if it was my child, as if it was my wife. So we need, the government needs to be serious and invest and get uh, get the investment, get returns from these investments that it has made. The other day I watched, there was a clip which was passing around and said, we are now coming to uh, recruit from you, nurses going to the US. How do you train nurses and let other people just come? I mean, yeah. it's a general thing. I mean, you can come and recruit whatever you want, but um, how do you let people to go and, um, uh, and uh, you know, fight a fire elsewhere and you leave your own home, you know, you know burning down? And on so, that note, I definitely want to bring the first lady in because personnel and, you know, that manpower on the ground is critical. If you were to give a wish list, if you will, to the national government and say, we need ABCD on the ground to have things working. What would that look like? Thank you very much. I like the way the doctors are talking because they are referring to figures, but these are people I see on a daily mm. basis. I see them in the, in the real sense. When you talk about solutions, you know Kenya is diverse and no solution fits all. While the lady in Turkana cannot take her child to the hospital because of insecurity, the solution that we'll give them in Turkana is not the solution we'll give in Migori where the lady goes to the market or goes to the lake to dry the fish and they need to be by the, by, by, by the lake for that period of time. My, 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 my immediate thoughts are number one, we should increase advocacy. You know, at times, even we have leaders who come into power, you, they may not know. Like for me, I didn't know the depth of the problem now until I got into it and I spoke, spoke to these people one-on-one. -on -one. This advocacy should extend from the highest level to the lowest level mm -hmm. so that they realize that what we are speaking is something that is going to harm us 20 or more years to come. Number two, we need to find a way of reaching these people. I think when I was young, we used to be even immunized in school. They would come and do the vaccinations in school and everything. If a mother is able to prepare the child and take the child, let's say, to the, to the ECD classroom, mm. why can't the government make arrangements so that they can reach that child where they are? If I'm able to, on Sunday, to go to church, is it possible for the government to have outreach so that I am reached in church where I am? Is it possible for the government to do something equivalent to what we used to have, the, 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 the beyond zero system, where we had this van that could move. It can go to the remote areas, have the necessary security, and have these children vaccinated. If it was also my wish, we have very critical personnel, the ones you've talking about, the CHVs, who are now being called community health providers. Mm. These people should be facilitated in some way or another. We found, I, I went to a place in Ukwala where they've been bought for motorcycles to be able by a partner because the county cannot afford to do that. They've been bought for motorcycles and they're able to move around. If these people called the CHVs can be facilitated in one way or another, they, I'm sure the commitment and because they see these people on a daily basis, they'll have the passion to, to ensure that whatever is required is done. And then also we need to also get more funding for the health sector. It, 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 is, it, is, it is very sad when a woman goes to the hospital 
and they cannot get the services because whatever is required is missing. And you go back to the, gov to, to the county gov government and you ask, because I am not an employee of the county government, my office is not constitutional, I cannot go and ask for money anywhere. But when you go to speak to them, they tell you the amount that reaches the county government is not sufficient. Is there any way the government, because the, at the end of the day, these children are the ones who are going to be, to own the Kenya that we are in currently. Is there any way the government can ensure that they find special ways of caring for these children outside even the county government system? Because the county government may not give it the required attention because of lack of funds, but the government owns all the money in Kenya. Can they at least find a way of ensuring that these women are rich so that the children are vaccinated? They may be keeping the children because they don't know or because they are not able to access these facilities. We have situations where women travel even 52 kilometers to reach the nearest hospital. Like now, and some of them, at times we have resources are not available. Like now in my county at the moment, we have about 202 centers that can do the vaccination. But out of those, about 42 of them, the fridges are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So even if the mothers were able to struggle and reach those areas, they'll not be able to get the vaccines because they cannot be stored in such areas. So I feel the county governments are struggling, but the government just needs to come in. They need to create something that is going to help the children because this is our future. If we don't take care of our future now, then the future will really judge us harshly. You know, First Lady talked about something critical, which is infrastructure, mm -hmm. Dr. Christine. Um, when you're talking about, what is it, 42 yeah. uh, clinics that don't have functional refrigerators. refrigerators. So even if the vaccines are there, they can't be adequately stored to, to serve um, you know, the patients that need them. So how do we kind of correct? Those are really small things when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. I think it comes, it all boils down to priorities, priorities, priorities. And when I say priorities, I'm not trying to say that the government is not prioritizing important things. But uh, like the first lady said, advocacy is key. Yeah. So advocacy involves I with the knowledge, Dr. with the knowledge, stepping in and actually coming out and putting the problem in a language that people can understand. These are the children of Kenya. They need these vaccines. Here are the bottlenecks. We have vaccines need to be stored in a certain temperature. If they are not stored in a certain temperature, they will go bad. We are only lacking fridges in this number of counties. Can we get fridges so that mothers don't have to travel that whole distance. The other thing we miss is the, you know, we look at economics as just the cost of the vaccine mm. and we say, no, we are providing the vaccine for free. But remember, this caregiver had other things to do. She had work, she had to go to the farm to get food. So she, and only to, to miss that and then go to the clinic and be told we cannot uh, vaccinate you today because one, uh, you know, the, the, the vaccines are not there. Why? Because the fridge is broken. Why? Because, you know, so it's things that need to be prioritized in the health budget. So advocacy is key. Making this an issue for everyone, not just an issue for the first lady, not just an issue for the mothers out there, not just an issue for somebody, a pediatrician like me, an issue for all Kenyans, all policymakers, all partners who, because we have willing donors, but they need to be made aware that there is an issue. Yeah, fridges are broken, you know, and that is once it's made aware and a priority, and everybody is talking about it, then it will be availed. Yeah, you know, Dr. Kireki, um, Dr. Christine talked about. Um, Parents and even First Lady talked about it, having to take time out of their day to take their children, you know, for instance, for immunization or other health services. I don't know if there's a way of incentivizing that process to where they feel I'll get something back for bringing my children, even though goodwill and being a mother who's responsible should be enough. But when you're thinking about and in their minds what they have to give up to bring their children to clinic, for instance, and for, you know, you come into a case where vaccines probably are not there, they've gone bad and, and whatever the case may be, but how can that process be incentivized, for instance? Um, uh, I think this, 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 these are serious issues because um, um, when a mother has to make a decision 
to whether do I take this kid for vaccination or do I go and look for a job somewhere so that I can be able to get some money so that I can put something on the table, you know, so that ETC, ETC. Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a huge problem. Now, uh, first of all, I think with the whole organization, you see, we've talked here about fridges getting spoiled. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't even talk about electricity fluctuations. Yeah. We didn't talk about that electricity not being there at all because there are places whereby there's no electricity. It doesn't mean that where there's no electricity, there are no people there. Mm. There are no mothers delivering who need, um, who need to be vaccinated and so on. So I think it is, um, we have to look at it from a, a holistic point of view. Um, do we have this, um, uh, that is where government comes in because this is government's responsibility. We as Kenyans, we pay taxes and in order, uh, if, uh, we, it, it is a, a contract. Mm. We pay taxes so that we can be able to receive uh, some certain services. We have roads, we have protection, we have health, we have schools, we have water and so on and so forth. So I think this is um, a, the ball which is right in the court of the government to make sure that we have these amenities. Now, these amenities, if they are there, what do we do now with these parents who are not able, who have to make a decision in the morning, do I take this child, um, you know, for, the, for, for vaccine or do I have to do something else? I think there have been programs which have helped in other areas. For example, when you talk about antenatal care, mm -hmm. where mothers, because there are some places where uptake of antenatal care was very, very low, and and Dr. Shege here talked about partners. They had partners who came and uh, some of the things that they introduced were, you know, um, some sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a, a card or something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you come for, if you come for antenatal care on a certain day, as per it is programmed, then there is a token that you get. And that token could be, uh, you know, in terms of mon monetary, monetary value or something that you could be able to use, you know, in order to, uh, to enhance your health. So this is one thing that can be done. Why not? We incentivize this mother, say, look, all these children are coming to a certain whatever. So when you come, you will get a hundred bob token such that you will not lose that time to go and look for that money. You will get that a hundred bob. What is a hundred bob in the greater scheme of things? Mm. It is really a drop in the ocean. Um, we talked about, um, uh, about awareness, awareness, awareness. Uh, we are doing that and we should always you know, continue uh, doing that because um, just as in psychology, the more we do something, the more we talk about it, the more we'll remember and the more we shall be able to do it. So education, education, education is very, is, um, uh, is very, very important. And I think investment in the infrastructure because unfortunately, um, um, Politicians think about uh, infrastructure, roads, you know, because this is something that is visible. But uh, I think the bigger investment should be in human, you know, in, 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 in human beings. Because if these people are not there, then there'll be no taxes, then there'll be no money to actually pay, you know, build, build those roads. So, and we need to have these serious discussions with, um, with the political, you know, political realm, as it were, such that all these things are, it, there has to be an ecosystem such that we don't lose, as uh, Dr. Tari here said, and um, uh, Her Excellency has said, these are our children. This is our future. These are our women. When you're losing nine women every day, there is a problem. There is a problem. Certainly, certainly. And on that note, let's take um, a short break as we continue on with this conversation. It certainly goes wider than just immunizing. It's looking at the whole ecosystem, as you said, Dr. Kireki. We'll be right back. Keep the conversation going on a line hashtag is Sunday Live. We'll be back.